Okay, so in our last lesson, we saw that um, Bohr took the data from the spectrum, the line spectrum that was generated with hydrogen, and he proposed that electrons could exist in certain n levels. n equals 1, n equals 2, the electron could be here, the electron could be here, but he proposed that the electron could not be anywhere in between that. And the question would be, well, okay, that's great, why would that be? So. Um, this leads us to what's called the dual nature of matter. So the wave nature of matter um, is something that was a new concept. We knew that electrons were particles. We can um, measure a mass for them and a charge for them. They knew there were particles. But de Broglie was the one who came along and said, mm, maybe they also have a wave nature and that there would be a wavelength associated with it. What this is going to lead to by the end of this lesson is what we call the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which really defines the nature of the electronic structure of an atom. Okay, so the, we're trying to answer why. Why an electron can be here, an electron can be here, but it cannot be anywhere in between. So his solution would be this, that if those waves had a uh, wave nature along with their particle nature, this would account for the fact that it cannot be in between those areas. Now the question is, well, how did that help? Okay, well let's look at this simplistic model that we see on the screen here. We have got on the left um, a certain distance away from the nucleus where the electron can be, and it can be there because its wave nature wraps around on itself and the wave can continue to exist. On the right, it's in an area distance away from the nucleus where its wavelength doesn't wrap around precisely on itself. So what would happen there is that the peak and the trough might interact and annihilate the wave, and that can't happen. So that was the proposal of why they have said maybe the waves could exist here, can't exist there because of the nature of a wave as it has a circumference around that nucleus. Well, that's all great. You propose something, but then you want to set off and see, can you examine the nature of these electrons and actually see a wave nature associated with it? And they did some experiments. So the, what we see here at the top of this uh, screen is what you would expect with particles. You slam particles from a source on the left towards the right, through some slits. And what you should see is some particles hitting beyond those slits. So you'd have a bright spot where the electrons hit a detecting screen where they can measure that and see the brightness where they're coming through the slits. And it would block any electrons that weren't coming through the slits. Well, that's what they would expect to see with particles. However, when an electron source actually comes through these two slits, instead you see what you see with light. You see a diffraction pattern, an interference pattern, where as they come out, waves do this naturally, where you'll see this dark light, dark light, dark. Anytime you have a wave, that's what you're gonna see. With light, we saw that, and they were really surprised to see this with the electrons. Or, if you're trying to predict that electrons have a uh, wave nature, maybe you're not surprised by it. So this gave the, all the evidence they needed that electrons not only behave as particles in some instances where we can measure their mass, we can measure their charge, but they also behave as a wave and we can see that interference pattern. So they did do some more studies with this and they came up with a relationship between wavelength of a particle and its mass and its velocity. So that's a V there. It's really hard to tell the difference between a V and a nu, but this is a V for velocity. With this equation, we see the same old Planck's constant we had before. We see the same symbol for wavelength that we've seen before. We're going to have to put mass in there and, um, of course, velocity. Now, velocity has units of meters per second. That's how fast they're traveling, okay? That's what we'll put in there. So what do we use this equation for? This equation is typically used to calculate the wavelength of a particle. As long as you know its mass, as long as you know the speed at which it's traveling, 
it is going to be used to calculate a wavelength. The key to this equation, O, is to watch your units. Plugging and chugging alone is going to mess you up. You've got to work very carefully with your units, and I'm going to show you this with an example of what I mean. Okay, so we've got our equation. Our equation is that the wavelength of a particle is Planck's constant divided by mass times the velocity. So let's plug in what we know here. We know Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joules times seconds. So that is Planck's constant. They tell me the mass. So we're doing it for a ping pong ball. So any particle is going to have a wavelength associated with it. We'll see how crazy its wavelength is here in a minute. But 2.5 grams, I'll put in there because they gave me a mass in that. And they gave me a velocity of 15.6 meters per second. Now I've written all my units down and nothing cancels. Nothing at all cancels here. Um, you might think, well, seconds cancel, but seconds is on the bottom of this fraction here. And if you are dividing by that, it's the same as multiplying by the reciprocal. And we'd actually have seconds squared. Um, they're not canceling anywhere. So what do we do? We've got to realize that a kilogram, I mean, a joule is not just a joule. It has a lot of base units associated with that. So in a few yes lessons ago, I said it's important that you know what a, a joule is. So what I'm going to do is actually write these numbers again down here, but with the right unit, 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34. And instead of a joule, I'm going to replace that with kilograms meter squared per second squared. Now that's all the joules, so I still have the seconds. And now this second can cancel with one of those. But this also reveals another problem. If I have this as 2.5 grams, a gram cannot cancel with a kilogram, and we need it to. So I'm going to go ahead and convert my grams to kilograms. So you always have to put kilograms into this equation. So kilo means a thousand. And there is that converted over to kilograms. And then I've got my meters per second. And I have meters and seconds here, so I don't have to do anything to that number. So now let's see if everything cancels that we need to cancel. The grams have already canceled. The kilograms cancel. Okay, One of these meters cancels with one of those meters. One of these seconds cancels one with one of those seconds, and that second cancels with the other one, and we're left with meters. They want to know what it is in nanometers, but let's get it in meters first, okay? So this would give me a value of uh, 1.7 times 10 to the minus 32. meters. That's a tiny meter. So we might say, well, let's have it in nanometers. Of course, that's what it's asking for, so we need to do that anyway. Okay? So I don't want um, nanometer, I mean meters, so I put a 1 with the prefix and what it means with the base unit. And this is going to give me 1.7 times 10 to the minus 23 nanometers. Okay? So... <laughs> This is ridiculously small. So while a ping pong ball can have a calculatable wavelength according to its mass, it's way, 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 way too tiny to pick up on that and actually see a wavelength with a particle that's bit that big. But when you start talking about very, very small particles, like electrons, where we're dividing by a very tiny, tiny mass, then we start getting wavelengths that are more reasonable and measurable wavelengths. So you'll never measure a wavelength of a ping pong ball, but it is possible to measure and see the diffraction and the, I mean the wavelengths and diffract out those wavelengths into different wavelengths um, for a particle. All right, let's see what else we have here. Okay. So this leads us, like I said, we were going to, to what we call the um, Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. We know that light behaves, I mean, electrons behave with a wave nature because of that interference pattern, dark light, dark light, dark light. Okay, so we know that electrons have a wave nature. We also know that electrons have a particle nature. They have a mass. They have a charge, and we can measure that mass. Particles have mass. So we know we have that. 
But if we try to observe both, and they have tried lots and lots of experiments, if you try to observe both aspects simultaneously, we always fail at doing so. Somebody came along and said, oh, I've got a great idea. What I could do is I could put in front of these slits a laser. And what we know about lasers, when an electron hits a laser, it will, it will light up and you can see the evidence of that electron in that laser. So they put this laser beam in front of the slits. And when they put this laser beam in front of the slits, when the electron hit the laser beam, you saw these little flashes but it destroyed that interference pattern. And now you see the particle nature. You see the evidence of them lighting up the laser beam and when you see that evidence, they come through and they strike that surface and now we see only two slits where the particles came through and hit the slits. So we cannot see both the wave nature and the particle nature of the electrons simultaneously. The Heisenberg uncertainty principle we see here, and this equation tells us um, that you can't know two things first uh, simultaneously about our electrons. Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Let's define the terms. The uncertainty in position is the delta x. This is, if we know it really well, the delta x gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, so this is a distance uh, of how well we know it. So do we know it somewhere in a big area? That's a big delta x. If we narrow in and say it's, it's really, really in this area right here, that is a small. So as that number gets smaller, then the delta x, I mean, as the uncertainty gets smaller and smaller, that delta x gets smaller and smaller. The next delta that we see is a delta nu. That is the uncertainty in its, oh, that's not a nu, that's a v. Uncertainty in its velocity, okay? Now, why is this important in uncertainty principle? With big things that we can observe and we can measure and we can look at, we can know where it is and how fast it's traveling. And with that, we can predict where it's going to be somewhere down the road. So let's think of a train. You know, this is a typical mathematical equation. Train leaves the station at 4.45 p.m. and it's traveling at this speed. When will it arrive at the next station? And you can know that because you know both its location and its speed. With an electron, the more you know about its its, where it's located, the less you can know about how fast it's traveling, so you don't know where it's going to be and predict where it's going to be at some point down the line. The no more you know about its speed, its velocity, the less you know about where it is. So you cannot know exactly what an electron is doing. What we can do is say, ah, it's going to be somewhere in this area, and we can have probabilities of that, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But I want you to look at that mathematical expression. Notice that the left side of that equation always has to stay bigger than the right side. So when the delta x gets smaller and smaller, the delta v has got to grow. And as the delta v gets smaller and smaller, the delta x has got to grow because there's that side has always got to stay bigger than Planck's constant divided by 4 times pi. And that is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So particles, and we're going to focus on electrons, so we'll just talk about electrons. Electrons have a dual nature. They have a wave nature, which is a new concept, and a particle nature. They've got that dual nature. Because of that dual nature, you cannot know with certainty where an electron is at one point and where it's heading and at what speed. So you cannot know exactly where an electron is and predict its path. That's going to lead us to a concept of orbitals eventually down the road. You've heard probably in some past chemistry class about orbitals and you've probably done electron configurations. We really want to know about those quantum numbers that are associated with this that comes out of equations that utilize Heisenberg's uncertainty principle.